many of you are familiar, we're on page, oh my God, 447, making our way. I had a, a friend who bought this book when she joined us one night. She said, it gets really repetitive the last 300 pages. <laughs> and I was like, that's the chalk. Arm. Like, we definitely need to hear it over and over and over, these same simple teachings. Tonight, there's a little bit of a, a bit more of a tender um, passage just kind of around um, honoring elders and ancestors. And it's the first time that happens in the book. So spoiler alert, there is some new content towards the end. And I did tell her just to skip towards when he dies. It gets really good. Again, <laughs> new teachings on impermanence. But oh yeah, I don't know an empty chair next to them where someone's not sitting because I see lots of clothes with quite a few folks. Can you raise your hand and just show me the chairs? So those are two right there and one right. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. All good. Great. And the way that for especially for new folks here. Uh, just so you know, the Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer-run center, which almost means it's like anarchy here. Is that, is that an equivalent? Uh, in a really good way. And so, you know, I am here as a teacher just um, to support the conversation and the container here. But really, a lot of what happens is our community. And some of you may be familiar with this term of Kalyana Mitra, so spiritual friends. So when we practice here the, together, we're going to be doing a guided meditation. We're going to be reviewing some of this text, kind of these ancient teachings, and we're also going to be engaging in conversation. And in order for us to have meaningful conversation and conversation that kind of resonates and highlights the themes that we talk about, there has to be some level of kind of shared values and commitment. And my invitation for you all this evening is to really consider these shared values and commitment. To be practicing in community means that we're not gonna agree with everyone. We might not resonate with what people are saying. And certainly we will have judgment and bias that is just coming up as we hear people talk and maybe even as we are speaking ourselves. And the invitation of being in a community of practice is to hold the entire experience of being here as practice. So to hold the entire experience of listening to others with compassion and speaking with compassion. And I think compassion is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but really what it means is recognizing that each and every one of us, we suffer. And each and every one of us wants to be free from that suffering. And in that way, we do have something deeply in common, right? We share that. So when we hold each other in compassion, we're kind of holding the collective and common humanity of one another. According to, uh, you know, many Buddhist philosophies, every single person in this room, look around, everyone in this room was your mother in another lifetime. So that might be a good association or bad for some of us here, but this idea that we are deeply interconnected, right? And whether or not you do believe in past lives and that there is that intimacy of connection, it matters. Each and every person in this room matters. So that's the, that's the invitation for our time of discussion. If we can't have that, the alchemy of our time together just doesn't happen. I could sit up here and lead you in a meditation and just talk. That would be slightly entertaining, but it wouldn't have any possibility of transformation unless you yourself are thinking about it, sharing about it, and hearing others. So especially because we have some new folks here tonight, everybody on board with holding one another, if not as your mother, that at least with compassion and care. Yay. And we're, we're going to do our best, right? And at the Dharma Collective, we're always eager to hear feedback and learn more of ways that we can make this place feel more inviting and more um, connected. I shared last week and kind of want us to continue on this theme that in order for us to practice meditation, we actually have to have some level of feeling safe and at ease. So I don't know about you all, but sometimes I'm like, oh man, I gotta, I'm gonna meditate today. So I gotta like do it. And you kind of like slide into it and you just sit down and the rest of your day is like all around you and like the residue of everything that's happened in that day or difficulties. It's, it's like 
either making you feel really agitated, maybe making you feel just kind of dull or just not allowing you to really be grounded and present. And for us to kind of ease into meditation, it does require us to essentially kind of emotionally co-regulate one another in this group, in this practice, and to recognize actually that it is one of the benefits of practicing together. So according to Buddhism, it's not just our practice, which is considered the Buddha. Uh, it's not just the teachings, right? The Dharma, it's the Sangha. So if we are not practicing with other people, it's actually we're not really living into the full potential of the practice. Maybe it'll help us relax or sleep better, but we won't get the transformation. We won't learn about ourselves and have insights that translate into truly uh, moving towards human flourishing, reducing some of the difficulties. So it's such a great opportunity to be together and we can you know, physiologically co-regulate one another, but we can also you know, be kind of um, have the opposite effect and be like, oh my God, there's a lot of people in this room. Sometimes the chairs feel pretty close together, right? So we actually, it's not that we're gonna change anything and close our eyes and pretend nobody's here. What we do change and shift is our perspective of why we are here together. It's not only because, okay, it you know, requires me to be here, there's a responsibility, but that being here together is a huge gift to one another. Like every single person who is here is offering the generosity of their presence and that that is what allows our practice to happen. So thank you all for offering your presence and for being here so that we can all practice. The practice we're going to start with tonight is a practice that's called the handshake with emotion practice. It's an old favorite here at the Dharma Collective. And uh, this is a practice that I learned from Sokni Rinpoche, who was a beautiful teacher. Um, he is, him and his brother Minga Rinpoche have been teaching uh, outside of their, um, where they learned and practiced. They're both from Tibet, but grew up in Nepal. And they've been practicing kind of all over the world, like whether it's, you know, in Japan or in Brazil or here in the U.S. And they have recognized, especially Sokni Rinpoche, that the kinds of practices he learned, these traditional practices needed to be adapted to the contemporary times of today. And I, I joke sometimes that this book, which chronicles the historical life of the Buddha, so beautifully put together by Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddha would hate this book, not because of what's in it, but he didn't want anything in his lifetime to be written down. There's nothing written down from the lifetime of the Buddha. And that's not because he thought he wasn't doing it well, but he thought that once you wrote it down, it becomes stuck and solid. You create an idea and a concept about it and the aliveness of the practice dies. So I love that Sokni Rinpoche, he's really adapted and created this handshake of emotion practice to meet the conditions of today. And one of the things he realized is when he was offering his students these kind of I air quote simple practices of following the breath. If anyone has tried for even one minute, you know it's not simple to try to clear the mind and follow the breath. But even when he was offering these simple practices, people really struggled. They struggled to get out of their head, but often what is in the head has to do also with these kind of feelings or emotions or experiences that we're bringing into practice. And so with the handshake, instead of trying to push away your feeling of anxiety or loneliness or agitation, you really meet it as though it is, which it is, your equal, as though it is, which it is, something that is there to support you. That's really different than sitting, having an experience arise that's hard to be with, let's say worry. Anybody here feel worry? Yeah, so worry arises, right? One thing we could do with that worry, and Sokni loves his uh, kind of like hand gestures, you could just push it away. No, the worry's not happening. That's not shaking hands, right? That's suppressing. You could also like try to ignore, like, oh yeah, that's worry. I'm not going to pay any attention. But actually, it's like draining your mental energy to kind of avoid 
right? So that we can suppress, we can try to avoid. And then another tricky thing we can do that seems like it might be the right practice is we can over embrace. So our worry arises and we're like, oh, it's okay. I'm okay. I love myself. We're okay. Like there's so, there's so many good times when it's appropriate to apply compassion to our difficult emotions. But when we do so, it has a similar effect as the suppression. It immediately pushes it away and doesn't give us the opportunity to observe that an emotion will naturally rise and fall. It won't stay forever. And to give ourselves that opportunity to kind of shake hands with it is to give it the space it needs and to allow us to like watch the physiological experience of the emotion come and go. One thing that can really help this practice is for us to have a sense of what emotions are like in the body before we begin. So sometimes we start a meditation practice and there's an instruction given and it ends up kind of pulling us out of the practice. We're like, what does she mean, feel emotion in the body? So before we start, we're going to do just a mini experiment. So I invite you, if it's comfortable, to have your eyes closed. And for just a moment or two, checking into the body and noticing what it feels like to be here. And then taking a moment and kind of allowing yourself to think about, like deliberately think about something that has happened in the last day or two that made you feel stressed out. It can be hard to choose one, but the invitation is choose one thing in which you had a sense of stress. And for just a couple moments, almost amplify that by really bringing vividly to mind what was happening, who was involved. As we bring this to mind, for many of us, we start to have the cascade of the sensations in the body, almost reliving that experience. See if you can notice the sensations in the body associated with stress. Where are they? And what is the quality that they have? Are they in the face, or the chest, or the belly? Are they warm or cold, tingling or heavy? And then allow this to maybe slip away to the side, kind of a little bit of pushing, not shaking hands. And bring to mind a time in the last couple of days when you felt a deep sense of okayness, contentment, goodness. Maybe it was a cup of tea or coffee. Maybe a smile from a friend. Maybe those first feelings of the raindrops tonight. Again, choose just one thing and again, amplify, really notice and recall the details. Notice where you feel sensations in the body. And what are the qualities of these sensations? Tingling, warm, light, heavy. And then gently wiggling fingers and toes, and blinking eyes back open into our shared space. So before we do the practice, were folks able to recognize and identify sensations in the body? And it's okay if not, but with fear or like stress, some people, okay, where did you feel it? 
between my shoulders. Between the shoulders, torso, torso contracting in. Anybody else? Yeah. In the stomach. Yep. Diane too. Yep. In the forehead. Okay. Solar plexus. Tightening in the chest. Tightening in the chest. In the jaw. And it's natural. So this is, you know, this is a practice that in uh, contemporary scientific terms would be called interoception or body awareness. There is like a pretty natural distribution for some people to just really be able to identify emotions in the body. And for others of us, it might be harder. So that's no problem if it's kind of diffuse or not so clear. But does anyone have a question about like, where am I supposed to be looking or how am I feeling it? Anyone have any questions? It's really important. And if you have a question, I'm sure you're not the only one. Okay. How about that feeling of goodness or contentment? Somewhat. Okay. That was harder to find in the body. Harder to find in the body. Yeah. Than when they stress. Mm. You got some homework. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, that it's. I mean, stress is like a. It's a little bit of an easy one to kind of pull and and get those sensations, but you know, feeling good in the body should be fairly and can be fairly available to us. And it can happen. It might be more subtle and harder to recall, but it is happening all the time. I, I do really believe in a lot of the literature around the daily distribution of our states of emotion. I do think that we have at least half of our experiences on a day-to-day -day basis of emotion are ones that we find enjoyable my contentment, feeling of some sort of joy or pleasantness. And then, of course, we do have those other difficult ones. But if we're really focusing and can remember the difficult experiences in our body, we may have an opportunity to do a little more savoring of what feels good in the body. Any, anywhere else, where did folks feel that kind of, um, yeah, a sense of goodness or contentment in the body? My face. face, heart center, heart center. Yeah. less gravity. Yeah, I have like the fullness or like lightness of the chest. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. And again, not necessarily like it's good or bad to feel it anywhere. The majority we feel our emotions in our torso, like here in our in our viscera uh, holding areas. But I have noticed with enjoyment. Now uh, you see in the research, people do identify it more over the whole body, which is kind of sweet, but don't let that influence your experience. Let yours be yours. So it's really important for us to be able to identify these sensations because in the handshake practice, we do just enough of that kind of igniting of the emotion so that we can then rest and observe it from as it recedes. One of the things we can notice is, though it may feel very strong at first, it will start to dissipate. And then our tricky mind will like bring forth, once again, whatever was the source of our struggle and difficulty, and that entire sensation returns. So part of the kind of wisdom is this practice, how do we learn to observe and let our emotions naturally unwind? So that's our practice. Any questions before we start this practice? I'll be guiding you, so don't worry. It's not like, and go, got it. Yeah. Probably 20 to 30. Yeah, yeah. And the invitation is, um, of course, we do have tea in the bathroom in the back, but that we wait till after the practice. And especially with a full room, people are going to be moving and sneezing and no problem, right? It's all part of our practice, but we do try to invite stillness. We know that stillness in the body can be a, a really great way for our mind to have a sense of what stillness is like. So you are welcome to scratch an itch. You're welcome to, you know, slightly adjust, but really inviting this kind of dignity of a posture of stillness, almost like we are like a sitting mountain. So that's the invitation. So yes, go ahead and stretch if you want. And we'll go ahead and start our practice. 
So giving ourselves a moment, I know we've been in this room, some of us at least for 20 minutes, but like look around the room, really kind of orient yourself to the space, knowing what's around you, knowing that Mason Lindsay are at the door here so we can kind of be at ease and feel restful. And for our posture, it's very helpful to have a posture that we feel like stable in, really stable from the base. So feeling the feet resting on the floor if we're seated in a chair. And being very deliberate with where we place our hands so that that can also contribute to a feeling of stability and presence. Ensuring that we have enough space for us to breathe completely naturally at the midline. So if you have your extra high waist, tight skinny jeans and you wanna give yourself a little unbutton just so you can really breathe fully, give yourself that space. And with the next inhale, imagine that you are inhaling and lengthening up through the spine. And feel and imagine that there's an invisible thread from the heart all the way up to the ceiling, just a slight shift upwards in the chest. <clears throat> Invite a softening through the face, softening through the eyes, between the brows, the forehead. And softening the cheekbones and the jaw. And as I ring the bell to start the practice, see if you can notice and follow the, the tone and resonance of the bell, really noticing fully as though all of your attention and awareness would inhabit the sound and listening. Just by sitting together, we've already achieved this posture, at least on the external level of stillness. We'll consider the inner posture of stillness as a willingness to release, or at least put to the side any of your to-dos and the rest of the day that has happened before, the plans for later. You could feel or imagine that this were kind of a backpack and you were just letting it go, letting it down onto the ground for the 
course of our practice together. And for the next couple breaths, really connecting and considering this quality of stillness in the body and this quality of stillness of releasing whatever we can release from the mind. to help us settle the inner speech that often unbroken narration of what's going on for us we can allow our mind to follow the course of the breath as we inhale feeling and imagining the breath traveling up the central channel from the sacrum to the crown and as we exhale imagining it returning back down so this feeling and imagining just a way to focus and refine our attention, inhaling, feeling, or imagining the breath traveling up the central channel. And exhale, returning from the crown back to the sacrum. And continuing to imagine this visualization if it's helpful. Really feeling the body breathing. We are not directing the breath, no force, no agenda. Just allowing the body to naturally breathe us. If you find yourself experiencing sleepiness, heaviness, pay more attention to the inhale. Finding that clarity, that vividness through the inhale. If the mind feels busy, thousand miles an hour, many thoughts, Give yourself an opportunity to focus more on the exhale and releasing.
every time you find yourself caught up and carried away, no problem. Just relax, release whatever has captured your attention, and gently return to this focus on the simple yet profound and beautiful attention and awareness of breath in the body. Now that we've established a bit of our body, speech, and mind to their natural states, stillness, vividness, relaxation, and ease, and take a moment and really inspire our motivation for being here. See if there is anything in the heart that naturally arises. What is the inspiration? What is the hope? It could be a felt quality. It could be a word or a phrase. But bringing forth and making manifest our intention, such an important part of our practice, a guiding light, the inner framework and structure. That too. <laughs> And whatever our personal inspiration or motivation may be, for a moment collectively connecting to the inspiration and motivation that these practices can help us in order that we can help others. Rousing that quality of bodhicitta, the awakened heart. And allowing this intention and motivation to reabsorb into the mind, to the body, to the heart. And shifting our practice now to bringing awareness throughout the entire body, almost as though we were pouring water into a vase, pouring our attention and awareness in the body. We may notice that we have aches or pains we hadn't even discovered. We may notice there is hunger or fullness, warmth or coolness. For a couple moments, just being very curious about this level of the form body, these sensations. Noticing that they may shift and move. And without any expectation, 
welcoming and being curious about these sensations in the body. If there is anywhere in the body that just feels too intense and uncomfortable, always you can switch to somewhere neutral, like the elbows or the ankles. Otherwise, allowing the attention for a bit longer to just simply roam freely in the body, noticing different sensations throughout the body. Mm, peeling back one more layer, becoming curious about the level of sensation in the body that isn't just the form body, not just hunger or thirst or warmth or coolness, something associated with our mood, our feelings, our emotions. Noticing if there is any emotion residue in the body, and again, with curiosity and openness, exploring and investigating this embodied emotion. And as we shift to shake hands more directly with our emotion, really taking one more look, refreshing our interests and sensations in the body, and bringing to mind maybe the same incident you thought about earlier, something stressful, Maybe not the most stressful thing going on in your life or in the world, but something that feels meaningful, a little bit juicy. And once again, bringing it vividly to mind, really recalling the situation and context. Remembering through all senses what was seen, heard, maybe even tasted or smelled. Without getting involved in analysis, why this happened, how it could have been avoided, who's right or who's wrong, just this kind of bare experiencing and remembering. And then as much as possible, completely releasing the images, the story, 
really fully bringing attention and awareness to the body. Noticing what may have shift, changed. If it's very subtle, no problem, just keep noticing. If it feels strong, as long as that's comfortable, no problem. But remembering you can always refocus on neutral areas, even open the eyes a little, put a hand on the belly. And the simple practice of shaking hands is just continuing over and over to drop full attention and awareness into the body. No agenda, no expectation, allowing the sensation of emotion to unfold, to unwind. Feel and imagine that this emotion and its experience in the body had all the space it needed. If you get caught right back up in the story of it, no problem. Again, relax, release, return. If you fall into dullness, no problem. Again, returning and refreshing your interest. As we're shaking hands with the emotion, we're doing so within the body. Not as though we are looking down on the body or this neutral distance stance, feeling and experiencing how these sensations move and change. With this full generosity of our attention and our awareness, Keep noticing and dropping and noticing and dropping. How has these experiences, these sensations shifted and changed? Have they moved to different areas in the body? Have they dissipated?
as these sensations may dissipate, there may be a greater experience of simple awareness in the body. We may become interested in the simple awareness, which could feel like vital energy, lightness, almost as though there were just more pixels of sensation throughout the body, more presence within the body. This can occur even as some of our emotion residue and sensations are unfolding. We may notice there's just a sense of kindness in attending to our experience just as it is. If there are still areas that feel heavy with emotion, maybe highlighting that sense of kindness and care. You could experiment with an exhale with the mouth open and releasing any areas that still remain stuck or heavy. For the last couple breaths, release any sense of doing just as much as possible. Have a sense of being within the body just as it is. Thank you for your practice. So for folks here in the room, there's a mic awkwardly placed right in the middle, uh, but we can hand it back to you in a round. Be curious if there are any questions or reflections. I know there's some veteran handshakers of emotion in the room, so who've done this before. 
but for many of you, it's probably a new practice. So any, any questions or reflections on the practice? Um, thank you. That was beautiful. That practice is what brought me here. I think mm. You you uh you were covering for Howie one Tuesday night, and, yeah. and and you did handshake, and I and it resonated so much with my Hakomi practice. Mm. You know, and my somatic experience in of myself. It helped so much with that that night that um um that I showed up here. And I've been here every week since. Look at you now. <laughs> so thank you. I, yeah. I, I hope we do more of that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I had a good um, experience to go with. I had somebody who was listening to um, uh, a podcast rant from somebody who I... Uh, have learned a lot from and really respect and then saying some things that were completely antithetical to how I feel about some things that are going on. And it was, um, and it hurt. Mm. And, 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 and some of it felt like a, you know, um, because of who it is, I, I listened difficultly. It was very difficult. And I listened to the whole thing and I, I took it all in and I, I tried to understand. And, um, and so I had a lot of emotions around it, anger and hurt, and confusion. And so it was very visceral. And I could feel it. Mm. It was this feeling of, um, there was something in the middle here that felt like I was split mm. up and down. I used to get this um, back spasm right here, and it felt like that, but mm. like in the center of my body. That and and um, and when I was in that energy, things were very discordant, and and um, and then as I would. Um, let go of the thoughts and move into the sensations um it would it would dissipate and and by the end of the of the exercise me being very confused as to where i stand and how to feel about this and everything i, I just it turned into this very solid that split was gone hmm. right and there was just this very solid feeling of myself in you know, in just in in presence and acceptance, mm. and um, and it just really helped me process this thing. Wonderful. Yeah. Without thinking. Right. The thinking was problematic. The thinking when when the thinking was there, which was necessary to feel it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that was very difficult. But when yeah. I, when I dropped into the emotional, the the felt sense of it. Yeah. Um, and, and let it go. It it's in stages. It took a couple stages until it it felt like it was completely gone, and 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 all of that that discord and confusion that was happening was yeah. you know solidified into this solid feeling of wholeness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have a a sense generally that when there's a difficult emotional experience, we got to do something about it. And that thinking would be a great way for us to work with it. Where like Shanti Deva tells us so beautifully, kind of thinking about it is like kerosene on the fire. It's just because we aren't usually seeing clearly when we're in the emotion itself and we're just amplifying and repeating and it might be surprising for some folks here that emotions last 30 to 90 seconds, generally. And what perpetuates the feeling of them going on and on and on is us thinking about them <laughs> over and over and over and re-triggering them. And just, you know, how profound it can be 
to observe the emotion rise and fall as a feeling wave, which is such a powerful thing to really directly experience. So thank you, Ron. Anybody else? Questions, concerns, insights? Yes. Question. And I maybe this is kind of a silly question because I when I do a mindfulness practice, I can sort of translate, okay, if I sort of keep building mindfulness, that will sort of lead me towards some destination or something that's really valuable. And I had a somewhat silly thought of like, is this a diversion, this thing we're doing, focusing on emotions or like, I'm really interested to hear from you, where does this, this kind of practice kind of fit on the spiritual path or where does this, yeah, what's the, yeah, how does this sort of contribute? Not silly at all. What a wonderful question. So I, I kind of half told the story. So Sokni created this handshake practice because it was so hard for his students to progress with mindfulness, to progress with other visualization practices. They were just hijacked by these emotional experiences that they didn't know how to deal with. Um, as I've said many times, but I'll say again, because such a great quote from Matthew Brensilver that meditation is like a disorganized exposure therapy, right? So we sit and practice and like stuff comes up, like we settle. And I do think of it, there's, yeah, like this is zero scientific evidence, but a lot of great uh, contemplative science, uh, first person contemplative science researchers, so people who have been studying their own minds for thousands of years, that when you really settle in, what can occur is things that need to be worked out or purified rise to the surface. Mm -hmm. So like, you know that from retreat, right? Mm -hmm. Things settle down and then all of a sudden the stuff can arise and not the surface level. I mean, that stuff happens too. Not the like, what's for dinner, what's for lunch, da, 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 da. But really that material that is, is kind of there. Mm -hmm. Why most people are afraid of going on retreat. They're like, oh no. I'm not going to do that. There's that stuff down there I don't want to deal with. Handshake is a great way to be with that stuff as it arises. In and of it, it's not a, a means per se in and of itself. However, Sukhni Rinpoche, you know, when he teaches it, um, there's two versions of it. You can, you can find this. He has many of these teachings on YouTube, but there's one that he did in... 2022 with Daniel Goleman, who some of you may know is a expert um, writer and academic in, uh, academic interest on emotion. He coined the term emotional intelligence. Uh, he's a longtime student of Sokni Rinpoche, and in an interview, Sokni talks about that you can really find emptiness through this practice. Yeah. Almost any practice of meditation where we pay attention can be a practice on emptiness. Right, because as the last two weeks we've been discussing, emptiness is just recognizing the interdependence of all things and how all things are changing and shifting. So if we really pay attention and notice that our emotions actually have no like forever content, right? So, you know, Ron having this like kind of betrayal feeling almost with someone he appreciates, it feels so solid, it's so real. And then, oh. That was just a feeling. So we could possibly take this practice all the way to the end of recognizing emptiness, but mostly we use it not as its own practice all the time, but as something that we can apply when we're meditating and that difficult emotion arises. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really great question. I think it's good to practice it. Like we evoked an event. Often with handshake, the way Sokni Rinpoche will teach it is you just wait until this the thing arises. Because it will. And that's I like that way, but I think it's kind of nice to bring up one thing so that we can get a sense of it. Um, so yeah, great question. Any other questions friends online or here in person anyone like i hope we never do that again <laughs> yeah how come i just i don't i don't know i think it's too hard for me uh tell me what was hard if you don't mind i think it's very brave and i appreciate you saying that 
I mean, I, I actually have zero insight around all of this. It's like every time you were guiding my brain into my mind, I forgot to listen the entire time. <laughs> Does that happen in other practices too? Meditation? In meditation in general? Totally, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so is it like, a, is something else coming in or is it just like a kind of blankness? It's both. Mm hmm so like other content that feels busy and then a kind of a, the lack of like being able to hear the words and them to land. Yeah. It's like both distraction and fugue state. Yep. I don't know. Y'all seem to like it and it's cool. You, there's Okay. I, mean, I will close my eyes, but who here struggled with some of that? So I don't feel bad if I see everything. <laughs> oh, I saw it. <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. Yeah. So were there, but, but I'll, I'll say something else about it, but like, were there moments in it where there was like a, oh, I kind of, I'm kind of tracking this or at least feel, I mean, mostly the goal is to feel both that sense of relaxation and also vividness. So what you were just like that kind of agitation, right? The many thoughts mm -hmm. that's, that is, um, when the mind can't relax. Right. And then not being able to really hear is like not having that vividness or clarity to be able to recognize what's happening. But were there parts of the practice that felt like the body and mind were kind of in the same place a little bit at ease? Can I go back to you? Yeah, totally. And I think what, you know, I think it's great. Um, it can be really hard to feel like we're doing it wrong. So what I'm trying to highlight is I don't think you're doing it wrong. And my guess is there's like more moments than you're giving yourself credit for where the mind and the heart and the body are actually at home and at ease. And then it gets swept away. And then, and that like, that's, that's a natural part of it and that it can change and shift over time. And then there's also some nights or days or weeks where that's even harder and more elusive. Um, but after the practice, if there isn't the self-criticism about how it should have been, is there a qualitative feeling of like, oh, like something is different? Or was it after the practice, like this is horrible, like it feels bad or somewhere in between? This is... A question, an not a rhetorical question. Oh, oh yeah, real question. Yes. Um, I think the closest I got to being present was noticing that I couldn't take a full breath in. Hmm. And I spent a while trying to do that. Yeah. And then everything else started hurting and I got distracted by that. Okay. And then at the end of the practice, what was the feeling, if anything? Um, release. <laughs> 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 yeah well my suggestion which doesn't work so well with here but is to sit for shorter time yeah sounds good you know uh we do sit like 20 to 30 minutes here because it's good to, to to have that in our repertoire but i would say like two minutes five minutes like just as long as you're like whoa i'm not tracking i'm out of it and um that can kind of build our appetite and then i was suggesting or hinting towards even our like worst practices and like actually, i think you were saying this earlier even at the end of a bad practice it's like actually that's okay like that wasn't actually horrible like i feel somehow you know like something has shifted so even kind of our bad like with exercise you know we we don't expect to always have it feel good it is but we know that there's like a nourishment or a goodness or strengthening with it so to kind of look out for that sense of after the practice but thanks for your courage i think there's one okay one hello one. there No, we can't hear you though. Yeah, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Maybe you could write it in the chat. Okay, we'll come back to Marnie there.
Okay. Anyone else now that that brave container has been broken of like, this is horrible. And the best part was like when it was over. <laughs> well, I'll add in. Uh, <laughs> so sorry. This, I, I mean, you know, I love you. I love so many Rinpoche and I love so many practices and this has never been one of my favorites for whatever reason. I have always struggled connecting with this one. And, mm. and today, finally, I, I was really appreciating being in the body. I was like, this is, this is what I need. Mm. I haven't been in my body in a long time. So like, I do really need this and mm. I should just accept it. And, and, and I did go through that and I did very at the very, and I was relieved when the bell rang. I was like, I think that she's going over 30 minutes here. <laughs> to be way past 30 minutes like she's really taking us on a journey and then i but finally i felt something release in my shoulders right at the very end and i was like maybe this was the point of all of it yeah and that felt really good and yeah so i i you know, I have been coming here for a long time and I've done this practice many times. And, and this is one practice I don't do on my own, yeah. but I still, of all the things like I can't guide myself into this one for yeah. some reason. And it, it's always kind of a, an enigma for me. Yeah. Good. And so I, I, I did feel after many years now, some affection for this practice in, right. in a positive way, even though I was struggling and my ankle was hurting and I was sitting down on the floor and I was just like, please ring the bell, please ring the bell, please ring the bell. <laughs> but I did, <laughs> but I did find like, but I did have some joy and contentment with the practice. And I love hearing about Sophie's hmm. teaching of it. Yeah. And, and I love your honesty and dedication. And I think this is a great practice also to try to just do on the spot and in the moment. So, you know, our day offers us a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And so it's like that right when the feeling arises of contraction, whether it's frustration, anxiety, jealousy, like notice the sensation. Mm -hmm. And instead of distracting, denying, avoiding, if you, if you do, if you even have like a minute or two minutes to just be like, oh, I'm just going to shake hands with it. You don't need to close your eyes. You don't need to sit down. Just what's it like to watch the feeling wave? That's a great way to practice it and yeah. to see if that kind of gives it more of a aliveness or purpose. So, yeah. yeah, no, it, it, it felt good. It was, I, I felt like maybe I need to watch that anxiety in my stomach unravel or something. Yeah. And I, it, it's hard. And one of my yeah. questions was like, it's being in a posture. I kept being like, Oh, I got to sit straight or, you know, yeah. I got to do better. You know, at the posture, it's hard sometimes to relax my shoulders or feel any relaxation. Cause I'm yes. like trying to be in this good attentive. Yes. Posture. No, there's no like good posture. I, <laughs> it is really nice to have uprightness, but you can also have that supine lying down. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people force themselves through practice in postures that aren't right. Um, so we should just do a little posture clinic style with you because, yeah. you know, the body really needs some support. And if we're focusing on the pain, we're missing out on a lot of the practice. Yeah. I know in like many of the Vipassana, you know, retreats, it becomes your practice and you push through and uh, we're not doing that. Um, different style, relaxation, different approach so let's find a way to get you comfortable yeah, yeah. i appreciate it uh, eve um yeah. i have a uh, marnie's uh comment uh, yes thank you yes um she wanted to relate uh i just uh wanted to comment that it was a relief to not label the feeling as good or bad i Yay. immediately felt a release flood my body and relaxation Hmm. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, Marnie. Yeah, right. We're not making a problem of the of the experience. Um, Sokni calls these difficult feelings our beautiful monsters. That's his uh, that's his term for them, you know, and how do we work with them and how do we meet them? And, you know, this this handshake is like honoring their dignity, not saying you're good or bad. And there's such a tendency in our contemporary culture to really seek only what is good or feels good. And we miss out a lot on the unbelievable benefit of 
learning from our difficult emotions too. So, okay, yes. Thanks. I just, um, okay, so this is kind of, I would say more almost in um, inspirational or I'm, you know, just what comes as we're doing this. I was thinking, okay, we're living, we live such a mental existence, right? We're so mental, you know, it's just like all the stories, all the stuff these techniques bring it into the body, right? Mm -hmm. Like just by observing, we're having a direct experience to actually what's happening, right? This like, which technically were protons, neutrons, and electrons in this dance. So when we can kind of observe how we can get spun out, it's like we're a, maybe we're a mental uh, body and spirit complex, you know, if we can, believe in that um and so i feel like we're in this mental experience by bringing it into the body or by just observing it we can use that bodily awareness to then potentially help our spirit or soul hmm. have have more presence in our existence right you know i don't know i was thinking like I mean, the keys, the Buddha is trying to teach us these yeah. skills so that we can become more enlivened in our experience here, right? Yeah. Someone once said to me that meditation is the digestion of our experience of being human. Mm. So by grounding and like bringing it out of the mental and utilizing our body to get the direct experience of what's happening, it can help us to like elevate our soul. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is all just like coming as we're practicing this, like, you know, yeah. Utilizing our complex so that we can overcome mm -hmm. the, the challenges, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. No, Beautiful. No, just, yeah. yeah. And I think again, some of those like insights that can happen during practice where we have a recognition of the interconnection, right. Of what, whether it's called spirit or divine or being or presence or awareness, it's really nice to not feel so much that we exist only from the neck up. Right. And to have that integrated sense and often the subtle body that we were kind of tapping into the sense of what it's like to experience emotions in the body, um, the subtle body can feel larger than the physical body, right? The awareness body, even larger than that. Just ideas and cosmologies, not forcing it on you, but noticing that there might be a different way that we can notice and be in the body that's very transformative, very expansive, makes us feel a sense of spaciousness. It's not literally that we get bigger. It's just like, oh, wow, what if my awareness doesn't only exist behind my eyes and between my ears? It's, it's a wonderful um, exploration. So thank you. Yes, Axelia. I had the feeling that Mr. Mr. Clean, Came, Mr. Clean came into my head. Who did? Mr. Clean. Mr. Clean. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. And washed my brain. Inside. And he washed your brain. <laughs> oh, so good. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. I know. Yeah. Claudia, <laughs> did you have something to say? Well, I have a question. Can I ask you, Eve? Please. Okay. So at the beginning, you were talking about worrying. And uh, <laughs> I do worry sometimes. But um, now, and I know it's about feeling the emotion, observing it, and see how it subsides and feeling it in the body. But now, now when I feel worry, uh, instead of worrying i feel well i have no control because usually you we worry about something that might happen in the future and i think mark twain said something like most of the things that we worry about never happen so i instead of worrying i kind of try to let it go and trust that for example if i'm worried about my son you know that that he'll be fine and instead i resort to wishing him well may, may you be safe maybe you know things like that yeah. and, 
But what my question is, I mean, does that mean by letting go, um, does that mean that I'm suppressing it or is that okay, like what I'm doing? Really good question. Yeah, and I think we just have to be kind of um, observing ourselves. So for folks who are, you know, practitioners like Claudia, where, you know, we do compassion practices a lot, formally and otherwise, even compassion can be a way that we spiritually bypass our real experiences. And so we just have to notice, right, if something difficult or I mean, I'm going through some worry myself right now, and I'm noticing that the worry sometimes I'm like, may I hold all of myself in compassion? May I be at ease? Maybe he's OK, moving on. Right. Like I just kind of use it to not feel right and to not go. And so we just have to be honest with ourselves. And is there a way? And sometimes when the worry is so intense or so poignant or so unresolved, we don't want to open up completely to the feeling. It might not be skillful means. So it might be that like the compassion ends up being kind of a analgesic for something really hard. And then we get to a point where we can feel it and release it and then still feel compassion. So there's no one right way, but it's a great question. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to share just a little bit here. It's a small section, but God, it was really, it's just so moving to me. Um, and again, for folks who haven't been here, we are approximately 30 years after the Buddha has awakened. He has all these amazing communities of practitioners throughout India and, you know, keeps having these different kind of teachings that arise, especially from his senior students. Um, early one morning, this is one of his senior students, uh, Venerable Mogalana, came to the Buddha and his eyes were filled with tears. The Buddha asked him what was the matter, and he answered, Last night during my meditation, my thoughts turned to my mother. I contemplated on my feelings for her. I know when I was young, I sometimes caused her sorrow, but that's not the source of my pain. My pain arises from the knowledge that I was unable to help her while she was alive, nor can I help her in her death. My mother's karma is heavy. She committed many crimes during her life, and I'm sure her bad karma follows her and continues to make her suffer. During my meditation, I saw her thin as a ghoul in a dark, foul place. There was a bowl of rice nearby, and I offered it to her, but when she placed the rice in her mouth, it turned to live coals. She had to spit it out in pain. This image will not leave me. I do not know how I can lighten her bad karma and help her find release. So just, you know, this is, you know, and just the pureness of his heart that like, you know, in his practice, right? Again, this purification, like what comes to mind, right? If your practice every day is that bodhi, bodhicitta of like, may I awaken for the sake of all beings? Um, it might actually be our family that comes last that we think about, right? It's some of those people that can be hard for us that we know so well. And the Buddha asks, what crimes did she commit when she was alive? And he says, she didn't practice respect for life. Her work required her to kill many creatures. She did not practice right speech. Her words were often sources of suffering to others. She was like someone who rips up living trees and plants dead ones in their place. I dare not recount all her transgressions. It's enough to say she violated all the five of the wonderful precepts. I would endure any suffering to reverse her karma. But tell me what I can do. Just so sweet. It was a good one for the holidays. I thought, you know. Yeah. Um, but just like, you know, like he can say these things. He's not really being rude. He's just being like, you know, who's got imperfect parents here who are like definitely dragging their karma into their next lifetime? Um, and the Buddha said, I'm so deeply moved by your love for your mother. Um, the debt of gratitude we owe our parents is as wide as the sky and as deep as the sea. A child should never forget the debt of gratitude. I don't know about that. Day and night. <laughs> like codependence, someone's talking about it. We were talking about attachment theory in Buddhism last week. But anyway, in times when there are no Buddhas or holy persons, parents should serve as Buddhas and holy persons. You did your best to help your mother while she was living. Your concern continues now that she has died. This shows how deep your love is. I'm happy to see it. 
The most important way to offer tribute to one's parents is by living a life of happiness and virtue. That is the best way to repay your debt of gratitude and to fulfill your parents' aspirations. Your life is such a life, Mogalana. Your life of peace and joy and happiness and virtue, it serves as a model to others. You've helped many find the path. Offer your life in good merit on behalf of your mother and her karma can be transformed. I have one more suggestion to help your mother. Um, on the last day of retreat season, ask the entire community to join in a transformation ceremony for your mother and pray and trans to pray and transfer our merits to her. Many monks in our Sangha possess deep concentration and virtue. Their energy of transformation and their prayers will join yours and be most powerful. Thanks to that, your mother's bad karma will dissolve and she'll have a chance to enter the path of true dharma. I'm sure there are others in our Sangha with similar situations. We should organize this ceremony on behalf of everyone's parents. Um, so arrange it and have this special day of transformation and we'll provide a good occasion to teach everyone about gratitude that we owe our parents and ancestors. Most people only appreciate their parents after they have died. Having parents can be a great happiness and a source of joy. Do, 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 do. Um, yes. So I, I just, I, I loved that aspiration. And some of us have parents who are still alive. Many of us have parents who are not alive. But in our dedication of our merit tonight together, I thought it might be nice for us all to dedicate some merit to our parents living and passed on. Um, you know, it's it's really, to me, so sweet when these teachings touch such a kind of personal level around the family and around our day-to-day -day life experiences. And it is interesting, wherever we are on the path of embracing or forgiving or rejecting and avoiding our parents and family, you know, they live inside of us, right? And whether we've chosen to not have contact, either literally or in our thoughts, like how do we work with that imprint within us? Something I, I think about a lot. And I love this idea of offering up a practice to them, right? That doesn't mean um, we don't have to also engage with them maybe more literally, but it is a really nice way to start kind of working with and, and sometimes healing for some of us, some of those obstacles between fully embracing and opening to love with those people who are close in our life. Uh, some of you may remember years back against the stream around the holidays, I'd always offer this um, teaching on the holiday schmear, the combination of shame and fear that a lot of us <laughs> experience ahead of the holiday season. Um, next Wednesday, I know many folks might be traveling in a way, but we will be gathering here, do some holiday schmear together. Um, so I hope you can join. I think that would be really nice to have some gratitude and, you know, a very, at best, complicated um, holiday celebration that doesn't necessarily highlight anything very good about our country's history. So what can we do here in practice of compassion and care together? I think it'd be extra meaningful. So, yeah, let's take a moment and dedicate some merit for our parents. Totally optional. If that still feels like, oh, not want to do that, you can absolutely dedicate merit to um, other beings as well in need. So let's take a moment and turn our attention and awareness inward. And in whatever way just comes naturally, bringing to mind a sense of, if not gratitude, appreciation for the life that we've been given. And bringing to mind a image or memory of our parents and as much as possible, a way that feels warm, or if not warm, at least clear. 
And considering the many ways that they most likely were making their way to relieving suffering, trying to find happiness, just like all beings. Possibly they were able to alleviate some suffering for themselves, maybe for you. And possibly they didn't have the circumstances that allowed that to really be possible. Really holding these beings, just like all beings, imperfect. And yet moving and trying to orient themselves towards compassion, kindness. And so with hands together in front of the chest, if that feels comfortable, reflecting on our time of practice here tonight, any energy that has been generated from dedicating ourselves to one another, to community, to learning, we offer up this merit that our parents may be relieved or alleviated of some of the burdens that they carry so that they could know a sense of peace and ease they could become more free of suffering. And that in this lifetime and others, they could be healthy and strong and know the joy of true belonging and the opportunity to wake up on the path. Thanks, everyone. That was fun. You know, didn't know you'd be practicing for your parents tonight, I bet. So we have some announcements coming up. First of all, like, welcome all these folks we haven't seen. So great to see you. Welcome all our friends who come all the time. We love to see you. We uh, really need your support to have this center continue. It's amazing to have a space that is free, right? But unfortunately not that free. So we would love to receive your support and donations. Um, I'll just say two things. I have no description written up, but I'm going to do a day of practice here after Thanksgiving. So that's Saturday, the 25th. 11 to 3, I'm just going to practice our butts off. That's the plan. Um, probably really just practice hard. I know there's some folks in here who like that, really yearning for that. And so look forward to doing that here together. It's not listed yet. Um, oh, sorry, but this other thing. Uh, but Ginny Ferraro and I are going to be teaching on New Year's Eve at Spirit Rock. Um, so keep your eye out. It should be fun. It's like weirdly early. Um, I think we end at 930. So if you also want to go to the club, <laughs> that's available for you. But that should be really great. And so keep your eyes peeled. I don't know when that's going to get listed. In person, on land. It's, on, it's online too, but that's boring. You should come in person. 